Hi, and welcome to Power of 10, a podcast about design operating at many levels, zooming out from thoughtful detail through to organizational transformation and onto changes in society and the world. It's also about our personal journeys through that world and life. My name's Andy Pallain. I'm a service design and innovation consultant, coach, trainer, and writer. My guest today is Maurice Cherry, founder and host of the award-winning Revision Path, a podcast that features black designers. It's the first podcast to be added to the permanent collection of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. He's currently principal and creative director at Lunch. Maurice, welcome to Power of Ten. Andy, thank you so much for having me. So um, the first thing I, you know, I always ask uh, people usually is, you know, tell me a bit about yourself and how you do. Now, I've noticed on your podcast something I've started to steal, which is um, just to sort of check in. It's been a, a tough, turbulent, um, more than half a year now. Um, so how are you doing? You know, I am, I am maintaining, uh, I would say, earlier on in the in the year, you know, things certainly were kind of looking up. It's 2020, you know, I was working at a tech startup i was planning out a tour actually for revision path to do some live shows in different cities you know things were kind of really looking up and actually i was out in los angeles in uh, february when news of the the virus really kind of started to hit the united states and i remember even flying back on the plane uh there were people on the plane wearing masks and everything but wow by the time i got back to atlanta and march had started you know, the lockdown started happening, events started getting canceled, and my whole year has kind of been upended. Uh, so I've mostly just been focusing on, well, one, the podcast, and two, trying not to get inundated with the American news cycle, uh, mm. because there's been so much that has also happened in the past six weeks that is not related to the pandemic, whether it's yeah black people being killed in the streets by police, the resulting, you know, civil protests and things that have happened. There's been earthquakes, there's been fires, there's been hurricanes. We're also in the middle of an election season. Like, there's a lot going on. So I've just been doing my best to maintain from day to day. Yeah, there is a lot going on. I think there is definitely a um, a need to sometimes just check out of that and, and get some perspective as well that you know, I was trying to think, uh, is there a time when we ever could do it? We took, we, we, I keep hearing things about, or well, companies keep writing, you know, in, turbo, in uncertain times, we're here for you and all of that <laughs> stuff. And I was actually trying to think, particularly around the social justice thing, uh, actually, is, you know, was there ever a time when it wasn't turbulent? Was there ever a time when any, everyone sat back and, and said, you know, this is sorted, everyone's, everyone's got an equal share? Uh, no. I mean, I would say not in my recollection of modern history, but <laughs> maybe at some point far, far in the past. Uh, and, and I say this not just, you know, out of out of comedic hyperbole, but also because I've been doing a lot of uh, looking back at old issues of magazines, most, uh, you know, most notably Ebony Magazine and yeah. Jet Magazine. And, you know, I saw the uh, it was. Uh, oh, God, when was this? I was looking at an issue of Ebony from the year that Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. Wow. And it was very interesting how ads back then were also posting these like innocuous black squares and message, you know, kind of empty messages of hope even back then. So this is clearly a tried and true marketing tactic right. because it's still continuing in 2020. Yeah. And so you see the echoes of it over and over and over. And, and it, you know, one, one aspect of this just makes you feel that we're just sort of hopeless, useless, useless uh, species, basically. I watched the David Attenborough uh, film about, you know, life on the planet, which was basically his witness statement of, you know, what he's seen as a, in a lifetime of doing natural history um, documentaries and how things have changed. But also, so there's that side, but there's a kind of another side of that, which is it, on the personal level of feeling really buffeted, really kind of... Um, that real sort of internal turbulence, sometimes I think it helps to kind of get a perspective. Of, you know, everyone before me also has had a lot of turbulence that they've they've had to work through, and now it's my time. Yeah, and I mean, I, I grew up in a city that was known for being very, you know, turbulent throughout the civil rights movement. I'm from Selma, Alabama. Right, wow. You know, I'm from kind of that first yeah. generation removed from, you know, the 1960s Bloody Sunday that happened at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which... Yeah. As a kid, I've walked over 
countless times. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, that kind of uh, remembrance and echoing of history is something that I've been surrounded by since I was a child. Uh, it's kind of hard to escape something like that when you grow up there. And, you know, I had teachers, uh, social studies teachers that would take us on field trips downtown and show us the spots on the street where their blood was spilled. Wow. And it's still stained there to this day. And, you know, so you never really forget it, you know, and I don't know if it's just because I'm here in the South and that's just where I happen to have been, you know, mm. born and raised. But uh, it is something that has been kind of an ever present part of my reality. Oh, that's some teaching method as well and experience as well that must really stick mm. so talking about your your background you've got this one you're one of those interesting people i've had a few people like this actually um where you you studied mathematics mm -hmm. and then you kind of went it took another kind of <laughs> pathway so let's let's go back to to you and your career um how okay. did you get from you know from there to here what's what's been the um you know, there's some spots at NASA in there too, right? Yeah, I, I uh, interned for a couple of years at two NASA facilities here in the States. Uh, I don't know. I've never really had, uh, aside, I just, I guess you could say for my education, I've, my career has never really followed a very sort of linear path. Uh, I've always mostly pursued things out of personal interest and then tried to find a way to monetize that interest so I can so I can have a roof over yeah. my head and food on the table. Uh, I mean, with math, it's interesting because I initially wanted to study English. I, I had been uh, writing all through uh, primary school, secondary school, did a ton of writing, poetry, essays, etc. Took college courses on children's lit, um, took AP English, two years of AP English. Uh, so I was a big big into writing. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, however, it wasn't really something that my mom was excited about in terms of future career prospects. Right, okay. The parental voice is always, uh, always strong. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's a good, you know, like it's a good hobby or it's, it's good that you can write, but like you need to actually have a, like a profession that pays. And, you know, this is during the nineties when the tech boom is really starting to, to gain momentum. Right. And I had seen, you know, uh, there had been, I guess you could say role models. I'll say possibility models, as as Laverne Cox puts it. But there are certainly these possibility models, not just on television, through uh, the sitcom no, called A Different World yeah, that was on NBC, yeah. where I could see someone who was a black male that was also working in technology. So I could see that possibility. But also, you know, in my hometown, like my father was an engineer for General Electric for a number right. of years. So it's not that you know, going into a STEM field or something like that, which might be more lucrative in the long mm. run, was a, a shot in the dark or anything like that. It just wasn't what I was interested in. I was good at it. I mean, I was good at all of my subjects in, in uh, middle school, high school, et cetera. But I was really into writing because I felt like that's where I could really express myself. But yeah, it, I wasn't getting scholarships for it. I was getting scholarships for, you know, math and science and everything. So that's kind of the path that I ended up taking. At least going into undergrad. Right. So so now, can I ask how old you are, actually? I am 39. I'll be 40 next year in March. Right. So, so that kind of classic moment of well, as, as well of kind of considering what the next stage of life is. So what, when you are, um, when did you make that sort of first decision, which is, like, okay, so I'm, I'm following the somewhat the script that's been kind of given to me, whether it's by you know parents or whether it's by um you know this is where the scholarships are this is where i'm, I'm getting supported mm -hmm. when was the was there a recognizable moment where you thought now hang on there's this other thing here uh, apart from the writing there's this other world out here and i want to be i want to be doing this or this looks interesting that's a good that's a good question um i think i've had several points like that which led to like an eventual reckoning so while I was big into writing as a child and, you know, even as a teenager, et cetera, I was also doing a lot of stuff with computers. Uh, I had been gifted my brother's old Laser 50 computer and I taught myself basic. Right. And then uh, my mother bought me a pre-computer 1000 and I taught myself how to do sound through basic mm -hmm. as well. And then when I, you know, would go to school and we had access to Apple IIe computers and then eventually access to uh, Macintosh computers, Apple computers, 
I learned HTML. I kind of taught myself that. And so that was something that I was always interested in, but didn't really know if it was a career prospect at all. I mean, I'm, I was in the, the middle of the, the country mm. in rural Alabama. Um, and while we did have access to the internet and access to computers, it wasn't necessarily something that I looked at and could say, Oh, this is a career that I can do one day because the internet was still very new. I mean, we're talking 1995, 1996. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. this is still a very, very new thing, you know, like, you know, peak browser wars, <laughs> et cetera. Like it's, it's uh, it wasn't something that I thought I could really do. Now, granted, by the time I got to college, I did sort of want to go into that. So I started out in college uh, with a computer science slash computer engineering dual degree program. Yeah. And with that, I was supposed to do three years of computer science undergrad and then do two years of computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And then in those five years, I would graduate with a bachelor's and a master's. That was the initial plan. Yeah. But when I got to Morehouse and took my first computer programming class, we were learning C++. And while I was understanding it, I just didn't like it. Like, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun, like, doing web programming. And I remember going to my advisor and telling him what I wanted to do and showing him the web and everything. And he just said that, you know, the internet is a fad. <laughs> like if, <laughs> okay. if, this is, if this is what you want to get into, then you should probably change your major because we don't do that here. Like we do real computer we do science. Proper, like proper engineering. Java and assembly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, all that stuff. And so I sat down and sort of looked over my, my credits and the course load and I had the, you know, the school course handbook and was really trying to figure out, well, I don't want to stay in this program. If, like, if I can't do yeah. stuff on the web, I don't want to stay in this because I don't like it. I was good at it, but I didn't like it. I, that was, you know, maybe that's another thing that has kind of fueled my career is that I've tended to go into passions and things that I liked, not just out of utility. Yeah. But after sitting down and figuring all that out, uh, math was kind of the next logical choice because it shared many of the same courses and credits as computer science. Plus, I had... Uh, credits from that summer. I was actually at, at uh, Morehouse College in the summer and uh, did a program there and had some credits. So I was like, oh, if I switch to math, I could actually graduate a little bit earlier. So I switched my major to math and uh, the rest is history. And I actually, I mean, I really like math. I, I'm saying I switched because I didn't like the computer science program, which is true. Mm -hmm. But I also really liked math. Like I was captain of the mathletes in high school. We went to math club competitions and placed like I was good at math. So it wasn't a stretch to go from computer science to math. And I really liked it. And so that's kind of where, where yeah. things went after that. And so then that, and then you had a, you went freelance and then you were kind of doing, or you were doing design stuff on the side to the, to the NASA stuff or what? What was the, I'm sort of interested in that moment where you kind of, you must have been by the sound of it, um, doing s this multimedia web, you know, fad thing mm -hmm. on the side. There must have been a moment <laughs> when you kind of thought, I know this is actually a real thing and this is something I can do for a living. Was there something you saw or someone you, someone you met, um, where that was a kind of a, a moment or was it a gradual process? I think it was a bit of a, a gradual process because, while I was in the computer science department and, you know, meeting other people that were in the major, there were other folks there that were also interested in the web, maybe not to the degree that I was in terms of like programming and designing, but they had an interest in it, you know, even if only just as a as a passive consumer. Um, and I mean, it might be weird to think of right now that in 1999, I was in college and the Internet was not a big thing. No, <laughs> it really was no, not. I, can, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I remember those days, but I think it's quite hard for some people to remember that, to think of that. Yeah. yeah and, and, and it was that sort of this nexus point where the Internet was certainly trying to become a thing. I mean, this is, you know, pre-Facebook, pre-My, I don't know if it's pre-MySpace. Maybe it was, but it certainly was definitely at a time when social media was not ruling the roost in terms of what people did in their spare time. Uh, we did a lot of hanging out and doing stuff in mm. person. Uh, but there were people that I met in my, you know, in the computer science department. There were other folks that I met at Morehouse that were interested in, you know, in the web. And I had opportunities to actually flex the little bit of HTML knowledge that I had and put it towards, you know, bigger things. So like for my scholarship program, 
they let me design the web page for that. Right. And, you know, I did sort of pick up a few freelance clients here and there for people that needed some, you know, web design work or needed like a little web page or something. Uh, once I uh, interned at NASA, the first internship I did, which was in the summer of 2000, um, that was at Moffett Field at Ames Research Center. Right. I actually got to do a little bit of web work there for their robotics education initiative. And that was when I really saw that this could be something that I could do as a profession because I think, one, I'm in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And this is right around the time I think Google started, yeah. maybe a year after Google started, something like that. But there were people out there like working on the web and doing the web and building the web. And so it became more of a possibility for me once I saw that there were people there doing it. And so I figured, well, I could just keep kind of doing this in my spare time and see what happens. Because, again, this is still super new. Yeah. No schools are teaching this. You you maybe might pick something up in a magazine article or uh, like reverse engineering yeah. source code on a website. There were a few books out about HTML, but they were mostly tied to the tools that you would use to create HTML. So it was tied to like, you know, Macromedia Dreamweaver mm. or something like that. Um so it was more tool based than language based. So a lot there was a lot of trial and error back then in those early days of the web, just trying to figure out like what works, what doesn't work, how does this work? You just figured it out and you kind of built the web as you did that. And so definitely seeing out there at Moffett Field that, you know, my skills could be used in a way that actually could help people and that there were folks that were working on this sort of stuff did lead me to think, okay, well, you know. This is something that I could still do in my spare time, but I didn't necessarily know how I would finagle my current education, you know, studying math mm -hmm. into doing design. I figured I could just do it on the side and maybe something would, would happen. Um, my mom was always a big proponent of, of having something of your own on the side from your main thing that you do. Right. Just so you can well, have, a lot. you know, your own creative control over it. So I always kind of kept... Yeah my design work, except for the work that I did for clients. I just sort of kept it to myself and continually honed my skills. And so you did manage to finagle that uh, career across into uh, a design career or a, a creative career. Um, yeah, it, it took a few years, but it happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, what, what was there a kind of moment there where you kind of went, okay, now I, I then this is a thing I, I want to be doing. Here's, here's, I, I want to work as in this role. I want to work as a, you know, in communications or in as a creative strategist. How did that all come about? Hmm. Now the creative strategist thing, that's fairly recent. I would say that's maybe within the past two to three years. And you know, to be honest, a lot of these titles, even I would say the title of creative strategist, are indicative of the times and the market that we're mm -hmm. in. I mean, yeah. when I started, you know, learning about HTML and the web back in the early 2000s, you were a graphic designer, a web designer, a or a web webmaster. Huh? Like that was, that was, <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of, that, those were the three yeah. positions that you had. And of course, now you have all types of different you know, designs and, and things mm. like that. Uh, creative strategy, I would say, mostly came about through my time working at Glitch, which is uh, my old employer, mm. because the work that I was doing was not just discreetly in one particular field. I mean, I kind of served almost as the company's in-house creative expert because I worked across so many teams doing different things. Like I would work with the business development and partnerships team, on new proposals and pitches to potential, you know, collaborators. I would work with our marketing department on campaigns. I would oversee the media team, you know, of producers and editors that we had for video and podcasts. I would work with engineers on translating new product features into marketing campaigns. So I was working across teams, across the entire company, not doing one set specific thing every day, but always juggling um, a number of different tasks. And because I think certainly with the the nine years of experience I have with running my own studio and managing a distributed team, I'm able to bring to the table more than just, oh, I can, you know, work in Photoshop yeah. or Sketch. But I can also bring the business level strategy about what we need to do and and things that we need to work on and, you know, look at the data and 
pull out insights and things of that nature. So that really has evolved with the times, like right. I said, within the past maybe two or three years. So within you, it's interesting listening to that because you, you know, with your, also with your coding and, and sort of math background, you've got the, uh, the engineering, I'm sure you can speak engineering too, right? So, so you've got mm-hmm. feasible, viable and desirable kind of all within you as, as one person. And I have a master's degree in telecommunications management. See, so there you go. There you go. <laughs> so I can also uh, work along those lines as well. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so let's talk about the podcast because um, you, as you said, you've this isn't you know, Black Lives Matter has obviously been going for some time, and you and yet you know there's been this uh, enormous in the last well in the last what six months probably or eight months there's been this huge um, attention on it again as a movement and it's gaining mm. momentum, thankfully. Um, but, you know, you've got a kind of unique perspective because you're not a kind of, oh, quick, quickly, me too, let's do a podcast about you. You've been uh, interviewing black designers and creative people for, um, what, since 2000 and how 13. long? 13, right? Yeah. So, um, and I think you said it, you started at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. So you must have seen... Um, well, first of all, I think I'm going to ask the kind of question, which I think has probably got an obvious answer, but what moved you okay. to start it? Uh, what moved me to start Revision Path was the fact that design media and really the design community was not giving black designers really any kind of recognition. I don't necessarily mean outsized feature level type, you know, yeah, yeah. recognition. This isn't This isn't like a an Oscar so white kind of campaign. It's more so like we're not being mentioned at all. Like it's back then and probably still to this case now in in some instances, but back then certainly it was very common to see all white speaker panels at conferences, um, you know, podcasts with all white guests and no one, you know, blinked an eye about it. No one said anything about it. Uh, My notion for starting revision path actually was earlier than that. I wanted to start it back in 2006. Uh, at the time, right. I uh, was doing another project of mine called the Black Weblog Awards, which I started in 2005. And with the Black Weblog Awards, the focus there was to show black bloggers and video bloggers and podcasters that, you know, we recognize you even if these other entities don't. Yeah. So I made the Black Weblog Awards. And in 2006, particularly, I that was the first year that we did a best blog design category, I believe. And I was a working designer at the time. I was working at AT and T, mm-hmm. um, and I had friends that were like working for Vibe magazine, that were doing websites for celebrities, that were doing like really big, you know, lucrative, splashy, you know, noteworthy kinds of projects. Right. But nobody was talking about them, and no one knew who they were, and it didn't seem like the industry was interested in knowing who they were. They still wanted to, you know, kind of prop up the same people over and over again every year. And so I wanted to start Revision Path then. Uh, I didn't know what form it would take, but I just didn't have the time. I was working full time at AT AT&T. I was also just starting grad school back then. And I was doing the Black Weblog Awards in my spare time. So I just didn't have, you know, enough free time to do it. It wasn't until, you know, seven years later in 2013, where at this point I've quit my job, started my studio, and I've been in my in my studio successfully now for five years that I'm like, okay, now I have the time to do this. And so initially when I started Revision Path, it was going to be, you know, kind of very similar to, um, I don't know, something like The Great Discontent or something where you have these long form yeah. 2000 plus word interviews or something like that is what I wanted to do. Uh, the problem was the frequency is just, you know, going back and forth with people over email and trying to pull everything together with photos. It was a lot. And I was doing it by myself. Uh, so it was a lot to kind of pull together. And someone who had been reading Revision Path, uh, this was a person in Chicago, she contacted me one day saying that, you know, she had been reading Revision Path and she really likes it and said that she was going to be coming down to visit Atlanta and wanted to know if we could record a podcast. And off the top of my head, I said, sure, because I've done podcasting Mm -hmm. before, so it wasn't a stretch. But at the time, I didn't have any podcasting equipment. I didn't have any mics or anything. So we did meet up, and I ended up recording it on my mobile phone at the time. 
Uh, the audio quality is terrible. It's it's actually episode one of Revision Bad, if anybody wants to go listen. Um, and I leave it up there to show the progression that the show has taken over the years. But that's really where the catalyst for the podcast started. Uh, if Raquel, that's her name, Raquel Rodriguez, yeah, if she didn't yeah. say to me like, oh, let's do a podcast. I don't know when that idea would have come to me. Um, I probably would have still been trying to do this long form, you know, article kind of thing. But once I did the interview with her, I was like, wait a minute, this is pretty easy. We can talk in like 60 minutes and I'll do some light editing and we can get it up and yeah. I can build a system around this. And so I did. And that's where we are now. So the engineer kicked in for that bit. But it's a good example of how um, small nudges and small coincidences uh, can can make a massive difference, right? Which is, you know, obviously part of it's part of structural inequality in addressing that. And it's, you know, you wrote this, this piece about where are all the black designers. And if you go mm -hmm. to the, if you go to the archive of, uh, of revision path, well, there are, uh, well, not all of them, but there are a subset of them. <laughs> and how many episodes you're on now? You stop numbering them. Oh, 367, right? The latest one. Yeah, was we're at three, 367 yeah. now. Um, as of, as of today, as we're recording this, I just recorded, uh, episode 371. A couple of days ago so I, I try to stay a little bit ahead uh my goal usually for every year my goal is to be done with recording for the year by halloween mm. so then anything that we do after that because november and december are always kind of dicey months for scheduling because of the holidays yeah um i, I don't know how that's going to look this year because of the pandemic but i still wanted to have my regular production schedule kick in so um, we have things that are still going to be going on through the holidays yeah. into next year without any interruption. So we we will hit episode 375 at the end of November. Right. And we'll just keep going. We're definitely on track to episode 400. And so with that, it gives you a kind of unique perspective um, and a kind of meta view, if I was to use this zooming analogy again and kind of to zoom up one level again, of... Mm -hmm. um, You've, you've spoken to all these people, you've spoken to all these uh, people in, uh, they're not all sort of pure designers, as we might say, I was going to say sort of black creatives. Is that a kind of a better catch-all, would you yeah, say? Yeah, that's a, that's a yeah. good catch-all, yeah. Um, you know, and over that kind of period of time, have you, have you recognized any sort of meta themes or common stories of, of people? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I would say first off, uh, the biggest theme that I would get is that it is so important to expose uh, children to these sort of alternative fields, art, design, tech, what have you. It's so important to expose them to that at an early age to give them the opportunity to make the choice if that's something that they want to do. Yeah. Um, for some people that we've had on the show, they grew up in a household where they were with a parent or with a, an uncle or someone that was you know, maybe in the industry and then that's how they got into it, you know. So they saw yeah. someone in their proximity that was doing it and it let them know that they could do it as well. Um, I would also say education plays a, a big role in this, particularly in high school, is letting, you know, high school students know about these types of careers. I mean, when I was in high school, whew, yeah. when I was in high school, <laughs> <laughs> my, my guidance counselor uh, was – uh, an extreme racist like she would not she did not want to see me succeed at all like wow. would not give me applications to colleges would regularly tell me that i need to learn a trade yeah. that i was wasting my time trying to you know you know focus on becoming valedictorian and all this sort of stuff like a, a lot of i had a lot of outsized opposition from white people essentially in my hometown uh, to venture into the field that I am now. So I say that high school education, I think is important because that's such a, a crucial point in a, in someone's development. Like you're, you're leaving the structure of, you know, K through 12 and going into something completely untested and something new, at least for you, yeah. like you're going to be most likely out of the, out of your house in a new space, learning something new, like having to forge new relationships, learning new material, like that's yeah. that's a lot. And so it's crucial, I think, at that point to really show 
what possibilities are there and to nurture those talents. Because as children, you know, certainly we are exposed to, you know, design, there's finger painting and coloring and all that sort of stuff. And then the older you get, the more that gets phased out of curriculum. I was going to say, it's, it's why most people, you know, when they look at designers or people who, you know, are, are the visual artists, they're always so lucky to be able to draw like that. When you get yeah. people to sketch, like in, in workshops or something like I do, get people into a corporate environment to, to sketch, they all sketch like 10-year-olds because that's when they stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then as you get older and that becomes a thing that you do, it, it ends up getting relegated to being a hobby. But I'd say that's the case because maybe they don't know about the potential career opportunities that this could, yeah. be, you know, this could become. It's a thing Akala talks about in his book Natives, when he's, you know, he was a very smart black kid growing up in London uh, in the 80s, which was a very kind of racist time in, in London in particular, and how many times he really overtly had teachers and people around him saying, oh, well, that's, you know, basically that's not for you. That's not for the likes of you. Mm -hmm. You can't do this. And it was only because that's what I meant by the nudging earlier. You know, it's only because someone uh, recognized, oh, hang on, you know, what, I think it was a, a librarian or someone in a kind of um, like a Sunday school or something said, hang on, you know, what's someone with a mind like you doing in this situation? You should be doing X, Y, and Z and kind of uh, pushed him and supported him and got him back into that. And uh, my next, I think the next episode coming up on Empower of Ten is with Elati L. Henson. And she was talking about this moment where it's like, oh, but that's a, you know, design and, and visual design is a thing that people do. For starters, mm -hmm. right? and it's also yeah. a thing that people who look like me can do, um, yeah. and and that kind of shift. And how, I mean, you talked about your your career guidance uh, counselor being a, a racist, and in in some respects, that when it's sort of overt like that, there's there's something to push against. But it's the sort of carelessness or the careless comment or the kind of of like not even presenting this thing to you not even presenting this idea to you or, or kind of just, mm -hmm. just the lack of effort which can often do the most damage because it goes un, unknown I, yeah I think. and i mean I, sh I should mention you know granted she was a part of that but you know my senior year and i've talked about this in in other interviews like my senior year there were there were teachers that were campaigning against me there yeah. were teachers that were failing me on purpose like it was it was at one point definitely a coordinated effort to ensure that I would not succeed, um, which yeah. is, you know, sinister and vile. It almost sounds like something out of a comic book. But, yeah, it's pretty hilarious. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, I'm wondering if stuff like that is still happening, but maybe not in just, you know, like you said, in such overt fashion. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say one other kind of central theme that I've gotten from interviewing people on the show is that mentorship and apprenticeship is super important particularly for underrepresented minorities going into design. Uh, yeah. I would say so now because, you know, sort of like how I said before with the job titles, you know, now there are so many different methods and ways and paths that you can go to become a designer in this industry. And they're not all going to be a part of a school's curriculum. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> there, there is sort of that linear path of you would leave high school and go to say, SVA or RISD or MICA or one of the, you know, like big design schools. And then you would just go into an agency or something from there. And that's one path. But it ends up getting marketed as the path when that is not really the case, especially with yeah. how much technology yeah. is a part of design. You don't have to go to college at all to be a working designer um, and to know kind of what the different paths are that you can go into. Like you could uh -huh. do strategic design, you could do service design like yeah. you do. You can yeah. be an experienced designer. There's, you know, now conversation design because of, you know, AI and mm -hmm. smart speakers yeah, and things yeah. like that. There's so many ways that you can go into that. And so having mentorship and apprenticeship to open someone's mind to these other possibilities is super important. Otherwise, you'll look at that linear path of, high school, college agency or high school, college tech firm or whatever, and think that's the only path to get into the industry. Yeah. And it's not. And then you're just following the script that everyone else is, is telling you is the right one. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes quite a lot of, um, I'll say resilience, but it takes quite a lot of kind of personal sense of self to push against that. Uh, but you know, hence the mentors and, and role models. There was a there's a great piece by um, Jahid Hussein in the UK um, called Whitewashed, where he talked about being at design school um, in the UK, in the UK and said, you know, I, there was no one who looked like me. None of my lecturers 
were, there was no, they were mm. all white. There was no people of color much my, amongst my lecturers. And so there was, the, again, that sort of un, unsaid, but very openly said in terms of just, you know, who's being presented in front of him, that this is a pathway for him or, or not. And so that stuff becomes really crucial. So, yeah. you know, I was talking to my ex-colleague Tanara Schneider about this and, and saying you know, the the rise of momentum that Black Lives Matter has created in, in, in the industry, and we we're talking about kind of design and innovation, um, must at one point be a kind of eye-rolling moment of like, you know, well, finally you're kind of getting it. And on the other hand... Um, must create a lot of inner turmoil and on the other hand uh, a sense of hope have you seen a kind of shift as you've gone through those years because it really is fascinating to kind of look through the back catalogue of Re revision path and kind of see this uh, so much has happened in the last seven years right yeah i mean a, a lot has happened in the design industry a lot has happened in the world in general um i mean there's certainly i would say if you go back to the archives probably most of 2016 has a, a slight political bent to it in terms yeah. of uh, the folks whom I was able to interview, as well as mm. honestly just the tenor of some of the interviews. I think mm. some of the most uh, poignant interviews that I've done have been from around that time, most specifically uh, a bonus interview that I did with Maya Patterson, who now is a she's a designer at Twitter. At the time, she was working at Trunk Club in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, but we had a very like real conversation, I think days, days after uh, our current president was elected. And then uh, there's a two part, I think it's the only two part interview I've done, but there's a two part interview with Kai Jacobs, who is an expat living in Amsterdam. And we talked about, I think the first interview we did was prior to the election. Yeah. And then the second one we did was following up afterwards. And it, was, it wasn't it was even about design. It was just about how do you feel about the country? And, you know, do you want to come back one day? Like, now you have a family. Do you want to, like, bring them back into this? And, you know, at the time in 2016, it's like, oh, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, now I'm sure the answer would be much different. Uh, not just because of the pandemic. I'm sure the answer would be much different. But yeah. certainly back then, those were some of our more poignant interviews. And we also had uh, talk with people that, you know, were involved in the Black Lives Matter movement that certainly worked alongside those kind of social justice causes. So I'd say that's probably been one way that the, the podcast has sort of changed a bit. It's kind of mm. changed with the focus of what the industry has been talking about. So like this year, for example... I think most interviews, we talk about the pandemic in some shape, form, or fashion. Yeah. Uh, but I also, at the end of the interview, try to you know inject a little bit of hope. Yeah. So I, I'll also ask every guest, how are you using your skills to build a more equitable future? Mm. So yes, you're doing these great things now, and that's wonderful. You know, and I'm not going to say that's a bad thing, but when you look at the state of the world, like how do you see your part in changing that? Or do you see your part in changing that? Yeah, no, it's true. And, and you've been doing that uh, in an enormous amount. Um, I've got a question for you, actually. It was only just sort of struck me um, just now as you were talking, which is, you know, with your creative strategist head on and with the kind of, uh, what's your, um, I don't want to say judgment, but what's your view on the uh, Black Lives Matters creative strategy, by which I mean, you know, how they've communicated the message and how that's been kind of uh, rolled out. Has it has it been a coordinated thing or has it been much more sort of grassroots than that? I think it's mostly been grassroots. Uh, I think, it, you know, when you look at certainly, you know, the protests that have, I, I would say, blossomed across the country this year, that has all been grassroots, you know, whether yeah. it's been the continued sustained protest in Portland and Seattle or even ones that have uh, arisen over, you know, police shootings like in Atlanta or yeah. in Minneapolis, et cetera. Um, it's definitely more grassroots. Now, I do think that corporate America has done a terrible job of co-opting it, um, which I think we all have seen from this past June. Yeah. When so many companies were coming out with, you know, black square solidarity is what i call it but they would post <laughs> these black squares on on instagram and, and yeah. twitter and as i alluded to earlier in my interview even that's not a new thing yeah yeah you yeah. know just like a total blackout like 
yeah, turn the lights off. That's the best way to, to handle the situation, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but they've, they've done that or they'll say, oh, well, we're going to, we're going to recognize Juneteenth as a, as a paid holiday. And I mean, okay, that's great, but that doesn't fix the systemic issues that is causing this unrest in the first place. Yeah. You know, there's murals painted in the street. What does that do? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a nice drone photo. What does that really do? That's not changing legislation. That's not defunding the police. That's not making sure that black people don't get shot in the street for, you know, yeah. breaking up a domestic violence situation or, you know, selling loose cigarettes outside of a convenience store. Like, it, it's not stopping the underlying problem. Yeah. And so... I think there are certainly there's certainly a lot of empty virtue signaling from companies that want to appear woke in order to, I don't know, take the focus off of their single digit, you know, (laughs) diversity numbers for their workforce or whatever. Yeah. Um, And what it ends up doing is that the, the people of color that work there have to pick up the slack in these ways that honestly, to me, feel cartoonish, Mm. uh, minstrelish in a way. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to name any any brand names because I would get in trouble. <laughs> but there's certainly some some uh, some well known brands out there that I, I when I see what they try to do around um, not necessarily around Black Lives Matter, but certainly around like showcasing how diverse they are. To me, it's like step and fetch it 2020. Like, yeah, yeah. what are you doing? You know. There are some organizations that are like actually, you know, saying like we're going to donate money, which is great. I think at this point, that's probably the best thing companies could do. Give up some of that money to the to the causes and the people and the organizations that are out there actually doing the work. You know, I'm not expecting, you know, SAS Company X to be out there on the front lines of the Black Lives Matter movement. You're a SAS company. Stay in that lane. But you can fund the people that are out there doing that. Like, yeah. do that. Do more of that. And you can put some money in, some of that money into, as you were saying, into education and mentoring initiatives, right? Yeah, to catch absolutely. That, that, that early on um, moment where people might get turned off uh, away. Because it, yeah, it feels we don't, we don't need... those are such fragile moments, really. Uh, you know, right. Like, just... we, don't, we don't need, uh, you know virtual conferences with dj sets and stuff like that like that's you know that's nice but i mean have they been there has there been virtual conferences with dj sets have there yeah i've obviously been not, oh, yes. not going to the right oh conference. yes oh yes <laughs> I'm, i mean that that actually applies to a lot of events that have happened over the summer but uh right. again like it doesn't fix the underlying issue especially from these companies that you know have millions and millions of dollars in annual recurring revenue like mm. Give up some of that money to the causes and the people that are out there fighting the fight. We're not, ex- I, I'm not expecting the SAS, may, maybe that's just a personal, you know, thing. Yeah, but yeah. I'm not expecting them to be out there on the front lines like that. But what they can do is support with their dollars. Yeah. And, and fix their HR. You know, it's interesting going back to, right to back to the beginning of this uh, interview where, you know, you're saying, I, I don't really fit the profile. And, and some of that's, it's often you don't fit the, what the recruiters understand the box to be. You know, um, mm-hmm. in in those things, it's it's pretty broken HR and recruitment quite often, particularly in the sort of tech space, which is you know, yeah, we want a UX UI designer who kind of is really across all these programming languages and knows strategic <laughs> things like what. There's no one that exists like that, um, and yeah. uh, it, it's it means that it's very easy. Again, it's those those kind of small moments which can suddenly just kind of shut a door. You know, it doesn't take, it, unfortunately, it doesn't take much of a nudge to completely shut the, uh, a door to people. And, um, you know, that's a thing that they could also fix and work on. Which I've Absolutely. almost, I've, we're coming up to time, I've almost, maybe I've, I've come up with the answer for you. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the podcast is named after this Ray and Charles Eames film about um, the relative size of things in the universe and this kind of zooming in and out of different levels about how small things can have an outsized effect or how the kind of whole structural thing can affect people individually is the kind of constant theme of the way I'd like to think and talk about design. So the final question is, what one small thing um, is either, you know, needs to be redesigned or is is well designed and overlooked uh, that has or would have an outsized effect on the world? Hmm. You know, the first thing that comes to mind, and this is probably super random, but the first thing that comes to mind are toenail clippers. 
<laughs> that, that's, pretty, that's, that's the most random one I've had so far. They are so poorly designed um, <laughs> for anyone. Like, it's just not... I mean, I, I get the utility of it in that, you know, you have a lever and there's the fulcrum and you're... You know, I, I get that. And like for fingernail, like you have fingernail clippers, that, you know, kind of works, but... Toenail clippers is weird because you're like stretching, especially to try to get like the pinky toe on the opposite foot. Like the toenail clippers are not well designed. And I've seen different types of uh, toenail clippers that have like a different <laughs> lever or something. It's it's they're not the most well designed product. I, I would like to see some more innovation okay. around that. And would the world be a better place if, if people had uh, more comfortable toenails, do you think? I think so. I mean... You wouldn't have gnarly looking toes. Do you think all this, so the, 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 the anger and violence in the world is in fact <laughs> down to people being having really uncomfortable shoes? Hey, look, we all have to walk on something. And walk in someone else's shoes, right? Yeah, so, sure. So where can people find you online? You're all over the inter, <laughs> interwebs. Where are you? Uh, so my website is mauricecherry.com. That's M-A-U-R-I-C-E. C H E R R Y dot com, cherry like the fruit. Mm-hmm. I am also on Twitter at Maurice Cherry, just all one word. Uh, and for Revision Path, you can find it at revisionpath.com. And you can find it on Twitter and Instagram as well. Just search for Revision Path. And uh, we are everywhere that you can find podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, you name it, we're there. Well, I'm still working my way through the archive because there's a, a massive amount there and it's really fascinating. There's a lot, but I'm pleased to know, see there's a few people I know as well, but it's also been a, a treat to kind of discover new people too. Maurice, yes. thank you so much for being my guest on Power of Ten. This was an absolute joy. Thank you again so much for having me. Take care. As I'm sure you're aware, you've been listening to Power of Ten. My name is Andy Pullane. You can find me at apolane on Twitter opalane.com where you can find more episodes and sign up for my newsletter doctor's note if you like the show please take a moment to give it a rating on itunes it really helps others find us and as always get in touch if you have any comments feedback or suggestions for guests all the links are in the show notes thanks for listening and see you next time